Good afternoon, and welcome to NFFF Connect. My name is Stephen Rainis. I am retired from the uh, New York City Fire Department, and I have the pleasure of hosting today's series of NFFF Connect for Ian Bennett, who's not available today. NFFF Connect occurs every fourth Sunday of each month, where we would discuss a line of duty death. Um, all participants will be muted. If you have a question or a comment, please utilize the chat function and uh, we'll follow up with our questions and comments. Today, we'll be speaking with Donald Feruglia, um, who is the District Fire Management Officer. Donald is a District Fire Management Officer, a Division Chief for the United States Department of Agriculture, Fire Service, Palumas National Forest in California. He started his wildland firefighting career in 1997 on a Type 3 engine. After two seasons on an engine, he was hired by the Lassen Interagency Hotshot Crew and spent the next seven years working from crew member to, to squad leader. In 2006, he was hired permanently as an engine operator, then on to battalion chief as the prescribed um, a fire and fuels management officer for six years, and then to his current position as fire district management officer. His highest ICS qualifications are type one operations section chief, type three incident commander, and prescribed fire boss, fire burn boss type one. Donald has two boys, eight and 12 years old, and spends his time off running around the woods with his wife and children, teaching them to love their public lands. Today, Donald will be discussing the line of duty death of Ian Howard, which occurred on August 21st, 2016. Ian Howard was assigned to the Mendocino National Forest in Northern California for an elevated period of red flag weather and extreme fire danger. As is typical while covering the other national forests nationally, Ian was pre-positioned with his type three engine to provide a rapid IA capability to the receiving unit. After a long shift, Ian went to his hotel room and died in his sleep from a cardiac event. Welcome, Donald. Hey, good day, Steve. How are you, Donald? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Very good. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Okay, so we'll be talking about Donald. Um, uh, we'll, we'll be talking about Ian, I apologize. Um, tell us about Firefighter Howard. Who was he? What do you want people to know about him? So Ian Howard, uh, he came to the uh, came to the district uh, and, and uh, it was uh, was just a firefighter. Uh, had moved up from Southern California, I believe, and, and uh, Ian was uh, was just one of those guys that was everybody liked and everybody liked to follow. And uh, Ian was uh, was uh, was a natural leader. He was uh, a guy that uh, cared for his crew, that that, that uh, cared for the for the mission of the agency, and uh, Ian uh, uh, worked his way up the ranks uh, through uh, through uh, firefighter up to, to fire engine operator to uh, to the position that he was in, which was an engineer job or a fire engine operator in the Forest Service. So yeah, uh, Ian, uh, it was a family a family man. He had he had two small children and a wife. Uh, he lived in Reno, Nevada, which was just about 45 minutes from his duty station at, at Frenchman Lake. Uh, and uh, up at Frenchman Lake, he ran that engine. Uh, uh, two days a week. He was the assistant there and, and uh, provided excellent leadership, was a good fireman and, and, a, and a good person. Uh, thank you. It's a great picture of him too with the, um, at one of the, the, the fires that he was at in the past. Great photo. Um, yeah. Tell us about the day of the incident. So I was actually uh, assigned, you know, to a, a, an incident down in Southern California on the Sequoia National Forest and. uh, uh, as part of uh, a response to a large wildland fire, one that had escaped initial attack and that we were trying to, uh, uh, you know, a campaign fire, a long duration event. So I was assigned to that incident uh, and I, I received a call from um, uh, from uh, the duty officer on the on the Mendocino National Forest uh, who said, uh, you know, I need you to uh, I need you to pull the car over and I need you to, to understand uh, a couple of things. So, something just happened to your engine uh, down here on the on the Mendocino. So um I got the call. Yeah, I was I was headed out. There was, you know, structures threatened. Uh, it was about to be a windy day, a hot, dry, windy day on the fire, and we, we knew we were going to have uh, problems. Uh, and so I had to immediately pivot right and uh, 
call my IC and, and call the boss and say, hey, I need to, I need to leave this fire and, and, and drive home uh, because he had, had passed away in his sleep. So um, we knew at, at the time very little, right? I knew that uh, his engine crew, um, you know, gathered at the engine in the morning as they were required to do, and, and Ian did, didn't come down the stairs. So, um, you know, there was, uh, I knew there was going to be some stuff going on there with the, with the engine crew and the, the stuff that they, that they had just seen and had to go through. They, they were, uh, you know, they went to the front desk and, and asked the front desk lady to let him in, explain the situation, and she did that. So, uh, the engineer, and for uh, rather his assistant uh, that was driving the engine at the time, had to find him. So, I knew I was going to have to deal with some of that. Uh, and, uh, you know, you go, uh, from fighting fire and doing what you do uh, all day to, to start to think about the, the ramifications of this. And, and I'd been through one previous, uh, you know, uh, death on, on the district from an engine captain that had also died in his sleep, uh, you know, off duty. So I, I kind of knew that the, what, uh, what was coming, but I, I really didn't know nearly enough about that. So uh, more on that obviously later, but yeah, so that, that first day was, it's, it's quite a bit of shock. It's quite a bit of processing, uh, uh, what's going on. And, 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 and for me as, as a leader in the agency, it's, it's thinking about how I'm going to support the people that are left behind as well as, as, uh, you know, I know that his family is going to be, uh, uh, expecting some things from the forest service and, uh, and, and rightfully so. So yeah, that, that's kind of the, the first day there, initial, uh, initial thoughts and, and responses. Yeah. A lot, a lot goes on when we lose someone like that. And, um, you know, you did a great job, you know, following up as the leader and, and making sure all the all the T's were crossed and the I's were dotted, and thank you for that. Um, tell us about what you experienced as the incident was unfolding. And you talked about it a little bit, but uh, can you elaborate on that some more? Sure, right. And so as we and and, and as we as we learned about what had happened and, and what uh, you know what was coming down, I, I did I did receive quite a bit of support from my agency. Um, you know, within the first 24 to 48 hours, typically when something like that happens in the forest service, we reach out to the family and we say, you know, knowing that it's a line of duty death, what are your, what are your wishes, right? What do you, what do you want to see from the agency? And, and Ian's wife came forward and said, you know, she'd like to see the full line of duty death, the procession uh, and, and everything. Right. And so, um, we stood up uh, an, an organization, an incident management organization, at kind of at the type three level there where uh, a lot of the ICS positions were filled. Uh, and uh, I was the uh, incident commander of that, of that team that's going to put together the procession and getting Ian transported back home and, um, you know, honor watch and all the things that go along with it, with a line of duty death like that. So um, I rapidly uh, shifted gears and, and uh, set up an incident command post and we, we started to put it together, right? We had a, we had a fairly complex operation going probably uh, at the peak of the operation there. We had, you know, 25 or 30 people that were all working to get uh, Ian's, you know, uh, uh, body home from, the Mendocino back up to, to, to Reno where he lived, right? We, we put him in a smoke jumper airplane and, and flew him up with his dad. Uh, we had to organize that and permissions that go into it. There's a ton of, uh, ton of backstory that goes on there that, that we don't really know about until we have to go through it and experience it. So yeah, that was uh, in the aftermath there. It starts to, uh, you know, we start to learn, uh, we provide a family liaison, right? So we want to make sure that the family feels supported by the agency and uh we put that in place and uh it's uh there's a lot of things that go into that with family dynamics and you know things that you need to be respectful of and, and learn about so uh definitely from from a wildland agency something we, not, we don't typically deal with a lot so it's a, it a steep learning curve for me and a steep learning curve for, for the folks that were helping me out but yeah that that's uh, that's a little bit of it there steve all right yeah it's it's important to the family that we get it right and um and I think you did get it right. So um, it gives them some solace anyway. Um, it's been almost six years since the incident. Um, what do you want today's firefighters to know about the incident? So I think it's good to know that, that um, when something like that occurs, even, even though in, in, my, in my particular instance, it wasn't a, a, death, a death by fire or something along those lines, which I've also had to deal with. But in Ian's case, it was a little bit different, right? And so I think it's good to highlight to, to everybody that even though, uh, you know, he didn't uh, uh, didn't go, you know, didn't have a, a death by fire per se, but we want to know that it we still want to honor him. Right. He was he was away from home. He was in travel status. He was uh, prepositioned somewhere to go out and fight fire and provide a rapid response. And, and just because, uh, it, you know, he died in his sleep, that's it's no less tragic. And so I think it's good to note that 
uh, you know, we, we, we want to honor those people as well and make sure that they get their, their due and um, know that, uh, you know, that the day's firefighters, right, that, that, that you will get that kind of support and that your family's going to get that kind of support uh, if something like that, uh, you know, unexpected happens in the line of duty. And, and uh, it's important to know that it's a family out here and that, that even, uh, you know, structure or wildland or it doesn't really matter. We're all out here doing the same job. And, um, you know, for example, right now I'm, I'm down here in northern New Mexico on the Hermit Peak Fire. That's why I'm dressed the way I am today. Uh, and uh, there's their structure and wildland firefighter. And we're, we're out here saving houses and we're out here, you know, uh, engaged fully on the wildland end of it. And, and uh, it's a risky, high risk environment. And uh, as such, we should be aware that, that uh, unexpected outcomes can happen. And that, that when they do happen, that we need to be able to pull together and support each other and support the family. Okay, that's important for all firefighters to know. Thank you. Um, okay, so what changes were implemented in the agency after this tragedy? You know, um, the the Forest Service and the agency really started to, to look at um, some of those things that uh, are, are pre-existing conditions. And in fact, the question, Steve, because we definitely, we just got some legislation through for federal firefighters that um, there's about, you know, eight or nine new pre-existing conditions that OWCP will consider uh, just, you know, uh, uh, hazards of the job. And, and, and that's a big step for us, right? And probably has something to do with what Ian, uh, put, you know, what possibly caused Ian uh, to pass away in his sleep. And so I think that, uh, that uh, slowly uh, we're, we're moving in that direction where we're, where we're starting to pull things together and really support the firefighter and, and realize and recognize that the firefighter has some in, uh, there's some inherent dangers out there in the fire ground and in the fire uh, environment that um, cannot be mitigated and, and are, are detrimental to people's health. And so I think it's good to know that we're slowly working in that direction to support the federal uh, fire uh, workforce with these pre-existing conditions. So that's one change I'd highlight. Yeah, well, that's the health and safety of, of our firefighters is the most, most important. And um, you never know when you're gonna be pushed to the limit. So um, that's great, that's good changes. Um, tell us about what you experienced in the aftermath of the incident. Once it was all over. So, yeah, so there's uh, there's one thing I really wanted to, to, to highlight today on that. And, and, and that's that um, even though, you know, you do your best and you do you, you try to follow the policy and you try to cross all the T's and, and dot all the I's that that sometimes there's things that are, that are out of your control. And one of those being that uh, in, in, in federal service, there's a there's a death benefit that comes when you pass away in the line of duty and, and, uh, you know, Ian's wife's still, still battling with uh, the department of labor to try to get that, uh, death benefit. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the semantics and nuances and, but, but mm -hmm. by the same token, it's, it's a long road for, for that family to run. And, and, uh, she, she kind of has to run that by herself, unfortunately. And it's, it's too bad that we aren't able to support her better and give her more, uh, tools in the toolbox to try to get through that, that process, but unfortunately, you know, after the, you know, after the funeral, that the agency kind of uh, steps back and doesn't do as much. So I think, um, you know, in the aftermath, I've learned that uh, sometimes we, uh, you know, we need to support uh, outside of our work, and, and sometimes that's okay. And so I try to support Carrie whenever I can, and she has questions, I always answer the phone and, uh, you know, try to help her out on that personal level. And uh, you know, the other one I would probably highlight is, is uh, you know, it starts to it starts to weigh on 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 you after a while, about 24 years in this agency. And, um, you know, it's uh, the, the, the death out here is, is real and, and it starts to compound itself. And so I think it's okay to know that, you know, that it, it's, it's okay to not be okay out here when, when you're having a bad day and, and, uh, and, and um, you know, that stuff piles up after a while. And I, as a young man, I really didn't think that it would, but it does. And, it, and it's affected me in, in ways that I never uh, imagined. And, uh, it, and you learn to cope and you learn to deal with it and you, and you learn to move on. And that's an important part of the healing. But um, it definitely, you know, something I've learned over the years is that it, it does affect you no matter how uh, much you think that it, that it doesn't. Yes, that's, that's why the National Fallen Firefighter has these programs to, to help the incident commanders and the company officers and the other firefighters. Because, you know, once we lose somebody, it's uh, still difficult on those that are left behind. And it's, uh, it's also great that you're still keeping in touch with his wife and trying to help her out so that she knows that, you know, we didn't forget about him. That's, that's yep. key. Yep. Um, what advice would you give the officers and firefighters who may have to deal with the loss of one of their own? So I would tell people that, uh, you know, it's, um, 
it's okay to, uh, like I was just saying, right. It's okay to take time and step back, but it's okay to, to get fully engaged there too. I think that's, it's a good part of the healing process for me was, was being able to run that whole memorial and procession and, and, uh, you know, do, uh, do that. It was definitely, um, it was good. And, and it was good to be at the helm and, and, and really steer the boat and, and, and give them a good send off. And so, uh, I think that, um, it's good to have some balance and, and it's good to, to have, uh, those people that uh, you can reach out to or, or, or the foundation or anybody like that, right. That, that uh, mm -hmm. can help you and uh, navigate that. And, and um, don't feel that uh, you would be out there alone in that because there is, there's a solid group of people that are willing to help out and step in and, and provide that, uh, that guidance and leadership because uh, a lot of us have been through it. Right. And so I think that um, it, it's good to know that help, help is available, help is out there and you should never have to navigate something like that by yourself. We're, we're here to help. Excellent. Yeah, that's good for everyone to know that there is help out there and you're not on your own. You're not alone. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Talk about Ian or yourself or, you know, the fire? No, no, I think that's, uh, I think that about covers it. You know, I think that um, what, what the foundation's doing uh, that, that I, I, you and I are, are a part of over the last uh, four or five years that we've been uh, getting together is, has been really good for me. And so it's opened my eyes to another world of of, uh, of resources in another world of, of uh, you know, places that we can go to get some help for, for this. And uh, it feels good, right? I'm, I'm, it's, it feels good to be a part of something like that. So I think that uh, I could pass that on to the people. This, the mission is good. And what you guys are doing are, is, is an excellent, uh, is a much needed service to, to the fire service. So uh, all, all agencies. So, um, you know, and, and uh, yeah, it, it's, um, it's good to, to get to talk about Ian again. I want him to know that he's not forgotten either. And so it's always, uh, I've been looking forward to this opportunity all day. <laughs> so it's good to talk about Ian and remember him in a positive light and, and know yeah. that, uh, you know, if somebody needs help out there. We're, we're here to help them. Oh, thank you, Donald. We really appreciate you spending the time and, and talking about Ian. Thank you. I'm just going to help everyone out yep. there. Okay. Yeah, thank thanks. You. Thank, all right. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Um, the next NFFF Connect will be on Thursday, June 23rd, 2022 at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, we'll have a discussion with Battalion Chief Jason Reese, Prince William County, Virginia Fire and Rescue Systems, about a residential structure fire that resulted in the line of duty death of firefighter Kyle Wilson on April 16, 2007. Chief Reese was the company officer at the time and will discuss the incident and share his experience in dealing with the aftermath. Thank you for joining us at NFFF Connect. I hope to see you on Thursday, the 23rd. Have a great afternoon.